It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke, and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. And Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf rayet stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot, but their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf and, thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, 
they know the space object's origin. Anyway, back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor. But those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them, and estimated their age 5 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life, and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. The James Webb Telescope, or JWST, is like the ultimate intergalactic paparazzi. It takes pictures of some of the most famous celebrities in the universe. Stars, galaxies, exoplanets, you name it. The James Webb Space Telescope will snap a photo. So if you're a fan of cosmic celebrities, let's take a look at some of these best star-studded photos. The Carina Nebula. The image of the nebula with the beautiful name Carina was published on July 12th. JWST captured a beautiful view of the nebula, located about 7,500 light years from Earth. Nicknamed the Cosmic Cliffs, it is, in fact, a hotbed of young stars, some of which are several times larger than our Sun. The Carina Nebula is a celestial spectacle located in the southern constellation Carina. It's really huge, approximately 260 light years across. Massive stars within this nebula are so bright and hot that they create a glowing cloud of gas and dust around them. 
the Carina Nebula also contains swirling clouds of gas and dust where new stars are being born. The gas collapses under its own weight, becomes hotter and denser, and all this eventually leads to the creation of new stars. However, the Carina Nebula isn't just some peaceful place of star formation. It's the site of some of the most destructive events in the universe, which create massive shockwaves that obliterate everything in their path. Very chaotic and cool. The Stefan's Quintet This photo was also posted on July 12th. Stefan's Quintet is a visual group of five galaxies located at a huge distance from us, about 290 million light years in the constellation of Pegasus. It's like a cosmic family reunion. All these galaxies are related to each other and interact with each other in some interesting ways. They're pulling and tugging on each other with their gravity, constantly exchanging gas and dust. This interaction is causing some of the galaxies to collide and merge, which can create all sorts of cool effects, like bursts of star formation and supernovae. Thanks to JWST, we were able to see shockwaves, tidal tails, and other amazing details about these galaxies. Their interactions create a stunning sight that we can see in this photo. Jupiter And here's our old giant friend. This image was published by NASA on August 22nd. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system, and it's known for its many moons and its beautiful swirling clouds but it also has a system of rings, just like Saturn, which are made up of tiny particles of dust that orbit the planet. These rings are much smaller and less visible than Saturn's, but they're still pretty neat. Jupiter also has auroras, which are colorful light displays that occur in the planet's atmosphere. They're caused by charged particles from the solar wind interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like on Earth, they can be seen near the poles of the planet. But these auroras are much brighter and more intense than ours. We can even see this crazy light show from space. And now, we were finally able to capture this dazzling sight. JWST's photo shows the auroras of Jupiter, its rings, and even two moons, Amalthea and Adrastea. It's amazing how bright and clear they are on this photo. The Cartwheel Galaxy NASA released this image on August 2nd. This photo shows us the Cartwheel Galaxy and its companions. The Cartwheel Galaxy gets its name from its shape. It kind of looks like a cartwheel, doesn't it? This is a giant swirling mass of stars, gas, and dust, which is located in the depths of space. It's shaped like a pinwheel with long spiral arms. These arms are held together by the gravity of the central region, which is home to a supermassive black hole. But the Cartwheel Galaxy is a bit different from its spiral relatives. It has formed when a smaller galaxy collided with a larger one, creating a shockwave that rippled through the gas and dust. We'll definitely have to visit this galaxy someday. It's sure to be a wild ride. Spiral Galaxy M74 And here comes another spiral galaxy. NASA released this image on July 22nd. JWST had to peer through thick layers of dust and gas to see this beautiful star cluster. M74 belongs to a special class of spiral galaxies known as the Grand Design Galaxy. This means that its spiral arms are noticeable and clearly outlined. All sorts of amazing things are happening inside of spiral galaxies. Supernovas, stars being born in clouds of gas and dust, and many other cosmic wonders. The glowing gas and dust, the bright stars, and the swirling patterns of the spiral arms make them some of the most striking objects in the universe. Well, we can clearly see it on the example of M74. The Tarantula Nebula This image of the nebula with a creepy name Tarantula was published on September 6th. The photo covers as much as 340 light years across. This is a huge distance. Thanks to this image, astronomers have discovered new young stars that were previously shrouded in dust. 
The Tarantula Nebula is located 160,000 light years away from us in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's the largest and brightest star forming region in the local group, the galaxies nearest our Milky Way. It's named after its shape, which looks like a bit like the legs of a big tarantula. It's a vast region of space, about 1,000 light years across, and it's home to some of the most massive and luminous stars in the universe. One of the reasons why the Tarantula Nebula is interesting to scientists is its composition. Its composition is close to the region of stars of the cosmic noon, the so-called state of our universe when it was only a few billion years old. At that time, star formation was at its peak. Thanks to the Webb Telescope, we can study this galaxy better and find out what our universe was like at its peak. Neptune's Rings This photo was published on September 21st, 2022. In this photo, we can even see six small moons next to the planet, with Triton shining brightly in the upper left corner. You didn't think it was the sun, did you? And yep, Neptune has rings too. They're like the ultimate cosmic accessory. They add a touch of glamour and style to the planet. But unlike some earthly bling, these rings are made of small particles of dust rather than diamonds and gold. There are five known rings around Neptune. The Gaul, Le Verrier, La Celle, Arago, and Adam's rings. Scientists think that these are relatively young, much younger than our solar system and much younger than, for example, Uranus's rings. They were probably created when one of Neptune's inner moons got too close to the planet and was torn apart by gravity. We haven't seen Neptune's ring so brightly since Voyager 2 flew past it back in 1989. So this is a great opportunity to take a closer look at these rings. The Pillars of Creation This photo was published on October 19th. The Pillars of Creation became famous thanks to the Hubble telescope, but this photo is very lush and much more detailed. These columns, located in the Eagle Nebula, are about 5 light years tall, which is really, really long. And they look like some majestic rock formations, only much more transparent. Just like a typical Hollywood movie set, they're full of action and special effects. They're home to some of the most dramatic processes in the universe. The gas and dust are collapsing under their own gravity, forming clumps that will eventually become stars. The place is full of intense radiation, jets of high-energy particles, and supernovae. It's like a cosmic version of Survivor. And if this wasn't creepy enough, here's another photo published by NASA on October 19th. They shared it right before Halloween. Here, the pillars resemble an eerie hand reaching for something. Brr. Anyway, all these photos give us a truly awe-inspiring sight. They remind us of the incredible complexity of the universe and the amazing things that are happening even in the darkest and most remote corners of the cosmos. Let's hope that the James Webb Telescope will continue to amaze us in the future. Recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has unearthed a mysterious ancient galaxy, and it might completely change our understanding of the nature of dark matter and the process of galaxy formation. The telescope has managed to spot a stellar population bigger than our home Milky Way galaxy from 11 billion years ago, and it shouldn't actually exist. This galaxy is massive and is home to extremely old stars. They formed in the early universe. The problem is that this new observation upends our current cosmological models since, by the time of the galaxy's birth, not enough dark matter had built up to seed such a formation. Researchers have been chasing this particular galaxy for seven years. They spent endless hours observing it with the help of the two largest telescopes on our planet to figure out how old it was. Unfortunately, it was too faint and too red, so no one could measure it. Only after scientists moved their observations to space and started using the James Webb Telescope did they manage to confirm the nature of the galaxy. The thing is, unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits around Earth, James Webb moves around the Sun one million miles away from Earth. That's why it made it possible to see the galaxy clearer. Previously, astronomers were sure that in early cosmic times, there were very few huge galaxies. But recent findings challenged these theoretical models. 
Extremely massive dormant galaxies have been discovered as early as one to two billion years after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. The scientists who led the spectral analysis of the James Webb Telescope data said that they were doing everything possible to confirm the oldest galaxies that existed deep in the universe. When they did, it pushed the boundaries of the current understanding of how galaxies form and evolve. And now, the main question is, how they managed to form so fast in the early universe, and what enigmatic mechanisms made them stop forming stars all of a sudden while the rest of the universe was still doing so. Galaxy formation is largely dictated by the concentration of dark matter. You see, around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It supposedly affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. Finding extremely massive galaxies so early in the universe is posing serious challenges to our standard model of cosmology. All because astronomers don't think that such monstrous dark matter structures as the ones hosting those massive galaxies had enough time to form. Researchers need more time to figure out how common such ancient galaxies are and how massive they can be. But if they manage to find more of those, it will really upset our ideas of galaxy formation. But it could improve our understanding of the physics of dark matter. Bizarre ancient galaxies aren't the only thing discovered thanks to James Webb. For example, scientists have long suspected that supermassive black holes could have existed in the early universe. And this theory has been proven only thanks to the JWST and its infrared eye. It showed that an ancient black hole within galaxy Sears 1019 was actively munching on all the matter it could lay its hands on. This hole is from the times when our universe was less than 600 million years old. And that's another mystery we're yet to crack. It's supposed to take way longer than 600 million years for a supermassive black hole to grow to its full potential. Astronomers were watching the galaxy hosting the unusually old black hole as part of the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey. They saw the galaxy as it was when our 13.8 billion year old universe was just 570 million years old. Besides the ancient black hole, scientists spotted two other ones. Those probably appeared 1 and 1.1 billion years after the Big Bang. They also discovered 11 ancient galaxies that existed between 470 and 675 million years after the beginning of cosmic history. The Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes cooperate to explore space. Their observations complement each other and provide us with a broader view of the universe. But there are some significant differences between these two space explorers. Let's compare them. Currently, James Webb is the largest and most technically advanced telescope we've ever built. It can peer back over 13.5 billion years, observing the first stars and galaxies forming in the darkness of the early universe. The telescope's infrared vision cuts through massive clouds of gas and dust where planetary systems and stars form. This ability goes way beyond Hubble's infrared view, used for studying distant exoplanets. Hubble can actually observe space in near-infrared light, but it was optimized for shorter ultraviolet and visible wavelengths of light. This difference is what makes Webb and Hubble an awesome pair of observatories covering a broad wavelength range. Both Hubble and Webb are reflecting telescopes, which means that they use curved mirrors instead of lenses to gather and bend light to their numerous instruments. And still, these two have some obvious differences. Hubble observes the universe from an orbit just above Earth's atmosphere. That's why it needs to block stray light coming from the Sun, as well as sunlight reflected by Earth and the Moon from entering the telescope. To accomplish it, the forward assembly of the observatory is wrapped in an insulated, aluminized Teflon light shield. This gives the telescope its tube shape. As for James Webb, it has a large, multi-layered sunshield that looks nothing like Hubble's light shield. And still, it serves the same purpose. Webb's primary mirror, which is more than 21 feet across, is way larger than Hubble's 7.9-foot one. No wonder Webb has more than six times the light-collecting area that Hubble has. It's very important at the longer and dimmer wavelengths of light James Webb sees. You see, the universe is constantly expanding, and light from distant objects gets stretched when it travels to Earth. 
Shorter, bluer wavelengths of light stretch toward longer, redder wavelengths. That's why distant objects that look bright in blue or ultraviolet light turn red or redshifted once their light reaches Earth. They also get way dimmer. Webb's primary mirror gathers more of this dim, redshifted light, giving us clear views of objects 100 times fainter than what Hubble can see. Hubble is optimized to see ultraviolet and visible light. That's why its primary mirror doesn't need to be as cold as Webb's. More than 200 thermal sensors keep Hubble's instruments at optimal temperatures. An array of heaters warms the back of Hubble's primary mirror. That's where the observatory's science equipment is located. This part needs to be stiff and thermally stable. So Hubble's heaters maintain a temperature of 70 degrees F. As for Webb, it needs to be much colder than Hubble to capture those faint infrared wavelengths of light. The problem is, unlike visible light, we can't see infrared light with our eyes. But we can feel it because it's heat, or thermal radiation. When you turn your face toward the sun, you feel warmth. That's what thermal radiation is. To be able to capture the remains of the heat from objects so insanely far away, Webb needs to be extremely cold – minus 364 degrees F. To maintain this temperature, the telescope needs to shield itself from the infrared radiation coming from the Sun, Earth, and the Moon. That's why it has to be way farther from our planet than Hubble. Hubble orbits Earth 326 miles above the surface of the planet. But Webb orbits the Sun with Earth around 1 million miles away from home. From its perspective, the Sun, Earth, and the Moon are always in the same part of the sky. It allows the observatory's enormous sun shield to block the light coming from these space objects and keep the telescope cool. The gravitational forces of Earth and the Sun also make it convenient and easy for the telescope to hold its orbit. Webb only needs an occasional modest rocket thrust to keep its steady orbit. As for Hubble, due to its close proximity to Earth, it needs to deal with a dent in our planet's magnetic field. This dent is called the South Atlantic Anomaly, and it collects charged particles from the Sun. It tends to cause communication disruptions and problems with electrical systems. Hubble has to pass through this region 10 times every day, staying there for nearly 15% of its time. Wow, the James Webb Telescope has been fully deployed! If you're interested in astronomy or space, you've got to be excited about the James Webb Space Telescope. Here's why. For starters, it's huge. How huge? The primary mirror of the JWST is over 21 feet wide. The Hubble Space Telescope, the previous largest eye in space, has a mirror of about 7 feet 10 and a half inches. By comparison, if you place the two telescopes side by side, it'd be like putting a horse next to an elephant. And elephants are enormous. There's a perfect reason why the web, as it's affectionately called, is massive. It has to be huge, because it's not an optical telescope in the traditional sense that most telescopes are. The JWST is an infrared telescope. It sees heat. Infrared light has a longer wavelength than visible light, so it needs a larger mirror to focus that light. So what do we have here with the James Webb Space Telescope? We have two never-before things going on. We have incredible technology and incredible science missions. Both the missions and the technology are out of this world cutting edge. The web is a classic example of engineering in the service of science. Because of its greater light gathering power, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to take images of things that we were never able to see before, but have always wanted to see. Things like exoplanets and the first galaxies in the universe, and stars and planets forming inside nebulae. And you can bet that there will be plenty of surprises too. The James Webb Space Telescope has several technological tricks up its sleeve, which promise to provide its greatest scientific discoveries. The Webb has a coronagraph, and a very special coronagraph at that. The coronagraph is the tool that will allow the first real pictures of exoplanets. The coronagraph blocks out the bright pinpoint light of stars, which we already know have planets orbiting around them. Without the coronagraph, the starlight would make things too bright to see these planets because planets are hundreds of thousands of times dimmer than the star. But with the coronagraph blocking the starlight, the exoplanets come into view. 
and the JWST coronagraph can block the light from up to 100 stars at once, we can expect a swarm of exoplanets. This brings us to the next high-tech gadget the JWST has up its sleeve, a no-slit spectrograph. Usually, an ordinary spectrograph will have a slit to allow a sliver of light to enter and be diffracted. Diffraction is the scattering of light to reveal the spectrum of the light's component wavelengths. But the James Webb Space Telescope's work is so sensitive that a sliver of light would overwhelm the optics. So a no-slit spectrograph was installed. The starlight gathered from the big mirror is sent into a fiber optic cable to send only a single spot of light into the spectroscope. And that's where the grism takes over. Sir Isaac Newton used a prism to discover the spectrum of sunlight, Roy G. Biv, as you may recall. But the web uses a grism. That's a compound word, like smog, which is smoke and fog. A grism is a graded prism. That means it has itsy bitsy, teeny tiny grooves that diffract the spot of light the big mirror sends down the fiber optic cable and into the spectrograph. The science of reading a spectrum of light is called spectroscopy. By analyzing the spectra of light from the exoplanets, the JWST will determine what gases are in the planet's atmospheres, as well as their density and even their temperature. It's an incredible advance in our knowledge. We'll be able to tell if a planet has oxygen or nitrogen, or methane, and other gases that may or may not indicate that the planet is habitable. Another Earth, perhaps. Presently, the JWST is parked in its permanent location. Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits the Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope orbits the Sun. It orbits the Sun at one of the gravitational balance points between the Earth-Sun system. It just stays there, without having to use much or any fuel to hold its position. So, as the Earth orbits the Sun, the James Webb remains parked at a spot that is also orbiting the Sun. There are five gravitational balance points between the Earth and Sun. They are called Lagrange points, after their discoverer, Joseph Louis Lagrange, in the 18th century. The web is parked at L2, the second of the five Lagrange points, which lies 932,000 miles out into space, way beyond the moon. All this to observe a spot of infrared light. But first, the engineers must get, or acquire, that spot of light. To get a spot of infrared light, the 18 hexagonal mirrors had to be unfolded from their position inside the Ariane rocket that sent the web into space. Once the mirrors have unfolded, their positions must be adjusted to microscopic level accuracy so that all 18 mirrors produce a single image. Several tiny motors are attached to each mirror segment to make these adjustments. These motors, which must be activated individually, will gradually pull the honeycomb-like mirror segments into alignment. It's a critical part of the mission and takes months to complete. To align the mirrors to produce a single spot of light, the James Webb Space Telescope can't be jiggling around. The telescope must be kept absolutely motionless, and that requires two other cutting-edge technologies, the sun shield and the cryo cooler. In space, direct sunlight is very hot, and shadow is very cold. Therefore, the James Webb Space Telescope brought along its own high-tech sun shield. It's huge, too, as big as a tennis court huge, comprised of five individual layers of Kapton film, only a millimeter thick. Each layer of the sun shield has to be remotely deployed individually using a system of eight motors and 139 actuators with thousands of parts. The purpose of the sun shield is to help the JWST stay cold. The colder, the better. And colder is what the cryo cooler is for. Temperature can be measured three different ways. In degrees Fahrenheit, where water freezes at 32 degrees and boils at 212. In degrees Celsius, where water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees. But neither of these thermometers have a starting point. So Lord Kelvin, in the 19th century, devised a third temperature scale, the Kelvin scale, which starts at absolute zero, the coldest temperature possible. The onboard cryo cooler will cool the JWST to just 7 degrees Kelvin, 7 degrees above absolute zero. At this temperature, virtually all heat from motors is removed, and the telescope will be able to focus the light to a point without any noise, basically any motion interfering with the quality of the image. Finally, after all this incredible technology functions remotely as planned, 
we are almost ready to observe the infrared images from the giant multi-segmented mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. Almost ready. A telescope can collect all the light it wants, but in the end, it must also be able to detect what it's collected. If the light is not detected, it's not truly observed. Enter the piece de resistance, the infrared detectors. The web has 15 of them. The specially fabricated semiconductor material produces a slight electrical charge when struck by a photon of infrared light. The web's infrared detectors can produce a million pixel high def image. A few of the detectors can produce a 4 million pixel image. They must be durable enough to last 10 to 20 years without warping or corrupting, all while working at 7 degrees above absolute zero. In themselves, the infrared detectors on the JWST are an engineering marvel. But what are they going to take pictures of? Ah, the missions of the JWST. Well, they're cutting edge too. 70 of the first 280 target observations are exoplanets. Is there another Earth? Which exoplanets seem habitable? The Webb Telescope will provide detailed spectroscopic analysis of the atmospheres of thousands of known exoplanets. For the first time, we will see images of exoplanets as they appear in infrared light. Cosmology, the study of the universe, is perhaps the primary mission for the web. Galaxies receding away so fast that their light is stretched into the infrared will be a prime target for observation. Hundreds of hours of observations are necessary to collect the faint infrared light from these first galaxies formed after the Big Bang. The JWST will give us a picture of what the infant universe looked like. Astronomers will learn new information about the dark energy that is driving the expansion of the universe and what role, if any, black holes play in the formation of galaxies. Star formation in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies is also part of the mission of the James Webb. By imaging hundreds of solar systems forming around newborn stars, astronomers will establish a definite history of solar system development. Now fact will replace theory and a big step forward will be taken in our understanding of space. The James Webb Space Telescope is a bold endeavor that will mark an epoch time in scientific history. It took a lot of time for the light emitted by several incredibly old galaxies to reach the James Webb Space Telescope. After scientists made more precise estimates, it turned out that the photons had been on the way for over 13 billion years. That's about as long as the entire history of the universe, and only recently have they reached our orbiting observatory. These dramatic results have revealed that the universe started creating stars almost immediately after the Big Bang. But if you look at the images delivered by the James Webb, you won't be overly impressed. Just a handful of smudges, a few glowing spheres, and something resembling a dog bone. And still, the world of astronomy has been left speechless. The telescope's giant mirror has managed to capture the oldest known galaxy in the entire universe. The galaxy got quite a prosaic name, mostly consisting of letters and numbers. Yeah, that's rather catchy. It appeared a mere 320 million years after the Big Bang. In comparison with our home galaxy, this ancient one was tiny. But after its birth, it started vigorously producing new stars at a rate comparable to that of the Milky Way. Interestingly, the Webb Telescope has managed to photograph a few other ancient galaxies that had the same characteristics. Based on the snapshots of the baby universe we've got, we can conclude that in those ancient times, the first galaxies and stars were evolving amazingly fast. They also appeared much earlier than most scientists thought. Now, let's talk about the hero of the day, the outstanding telescope itself. The James Webb Space Telescope is a stunning piece of equipment. It's around 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope, and the latter has observed places that are 13.4 billion light-years away. The James Webb Telescope is also on the pricey side, to put it mildly. Even though originally the cost of the telescope was estimated to be just $1 to $3.5 billion, the entire process of its construction cost around $10 billion. For comparison, NASA spent $4.7 billion to build and launch the Hubble telescope. And it was another $1.3 billion to fix it in orbit. Even though the James Webb Space Telescope itself is three stories high and the size of a tennis court, 
Its mirrors are the lightest large telescope mirrors of all time. No wonder, during the manufacturing process, they underwent a 92% reduction in weight. The lighter, the cheaper it is to send stuff to space. If you had a chance to look at these mirrors, they would seem to be gold. But they're made of beryllium. This is a steel-gray, lightweight, and brittle metal. A gold coating is still applied to each mirror, but they can't be produced entirely out of gold, since this material needs to expand and contract even with small temperature changes. And that's not what we need to happen to a super-precise piece of equipment. That's why the total amount of gold used in the construction of the James Webb telescope is less than 2 ounces. That's a golf ball-sized chunk of gold. The gold plates covering the mirror are only 1,000 atoms thick. If we speak about all those incredible feats the telescope is capable of, it can clearly see a US penny from 24 miles away and a football from 340 miles away. Hey, what's the score? JWST comes with significant advantages over any previous mission. For example, its 21-foot mirror is composed of 18 gold-plated hexagonal segments. They gather more than six times as much light as the Hubble Space Telescope's almost 8-foot mirror. It means that James Webb can record light from all kinds of space objects six times faster than its predecessor. The telescope's sensitivity to infrared light is also astonishing, which is remarkable since it can see different things than optical telescopes. You can say it's a real game-changer. The James Webb can observe wavelengths from 0.6 to 28.5 micrometers, from the red end of the visible spectrum to the mid-infrared. As for Hubble's optics, most of the telescope's sensitivity is centered on visible light. It might sound surprising, but in its intended infrared domain, the Webb telescope isn't likely to resolve finer details than Hubble can detect in optical light. The thing is that although resolution increases with the mirror size, it also diminishes with wavelength. James Webb's telescope side cools itself down because, otherwise, it might get damaged or even burn. Normally, its temperature doesn't rise higher than minus 370 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cold enough to make hydrogen liquid. An enormous five-layer sunshield surrounds the telescope and reflects as much sunlight as possible, letting the telescope stay cool. The telescope was launched near the equator because Earth spins a bit faster there, and this gave the rocket some extra push. When the James Webb Space Telescope runs out of fuel, it'll just keep orbiting the Sun. On the other hand, even though the telescope wasn't designed to be serviced or upgraded, it might potentially be refueled with the help of robots in the future. This might extend its lifespan. Anyway, here are the reasons why we can say this telescope has changed astronomy. For one thing, we might finally see dark matter. Around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. Dark matter is like some binding agent of our universe, and we're still not sure whether it exists. And now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, scientists might finally have a way to seek dark matter. It's a huge development that is likely to change the way we observe the known as well as unknown universe. Even though astronomers haven't seen dark matter directly yet, they have been able to trace the distribution of this mysterious universal compound, all thanks to James Webb's powerful instruments. Another reason the new space telescope is so cool is that it helps us learn more about star formation. This process has always been a foundational part of astronomical studies. But even though Hubble has provided us with some iconic images and observations, there are still many unanswered questions about how stars form and go out. But astronomers are sure that James Webb will fill in the blanks. All because this telescope can peer further and deeper into the universe than any other telescope that has ever existed. Its location and cutting-edge equipment allow it to gaze through gases and dust surrounding early galaxies and stars. It will let us get a better look at star formation. It's also obvious that Webb's discoveries are bound to change the way we think of the early universe. 
For example, recently, the telescope has revealed several large galaxies that scientists believe existed not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. And still, the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These six galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age 5 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. The most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars inhabiting them. This information doesn't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. Plus, it doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. Astronomers hope that one day, James Webb will help us find new exoplanets and even detect water there. For a long time, astronomers have been discovering planets orbiting stars outside the solar system by monitoring slight dips in stars' light. Such dips happen when planets pass in front of them, and reading unique signatures in the light can tell us about planets' chemical composition. The strongest and most readable signatures happen within the infrared spectrum. Have you just thought of James Webb's state-of-the-art infrared instruments too? They can help scientists spot new planets and even identify the presence of water there. The James Webb Space Telescope, an astounding piece of equipment built to outperform the Hubble Space Telescope, has made a terrifying and amazing discovery that might completely change our perception of the universe. It has successfully detected a faint glow coming from a staggering 7 trillion miles away. Can this glow be shining city lights coming from some mysterious extraterrestrial world galaxies away from us? Well, let's start from the beginning. A few years ago, NASA's Infrared Spitzer Space Telescope helped us spot a family of seven rocky exoplanets orbiting the same star. This star is known as TRAPPIST-1. And recently, our new infrared powerhouse, the James Webb Telescope, has measured the temperature of one of those distant worlds. It was a planet called TRAPPIST-1b. Unfortunately, it turned out that this Earth-like planet was totally uninhabitable. Astronomers took James Webb's mid-infrared camera, called MIRI, and looked at the planet's thermal emissions. We can picture the whole process as scientists using heat-sensing Terminator vision. The results were quite disappointing. TRAPPIST-1b turned out to be scorching. Its average temperature was around 450 degrees F. That's as hot as in an oven. Plus, the planet most likely doesn't have any atmosphere. At the same time, this discovery was another record-breaking first for the telescope, which had already produced some newsworthy results by that time. It was the first time researchers detected any form of light emitted by a small and relatively cool exoplanet similar to the rocky planets in our own solar system. No previous telescope had enough sensitivity to measure such dim, mid-infrared light. When seven TRAPPIST-1 exoplanets were first discovered, the astronomical community was ecstatic. That's because all those faraway worlds were about the size of our home planet and located in their star's habitable zone. It's the region that is just the right distance away from a star for liquid water to exist on a planet's surface. Thus, the planetary system became the best place to look for rocky planets with an atmosphere. But don't get too excited yet. These planets aren't likely to become new worlds for humans to explore. Mostly because the TRAPPIST-1 planets are totally out of our reach at the moment. They're just too far away, at a whopping 235 trillion miles away. Their star is also much smaller and redder than our sun. It's classified as an M-dwarf star. In our home Milky Way galaxy, there are twice as many of such stars as there are stars like the Sun. And they're also twice as likely to have rocky planets orbiting them. It's probably not surprising that astronomers are very interested in such stars. They're the main targets for seeking potentially habitable planets. And it's also way easier and more convenient to observe rocky planets around such smaller stars. But there's a catch. M dwarfs are more active than our Sun. They frequently flare and spew high-energy rays which are likely to be extremely damaging to planets' atmospheres and any forms of extraterrestrial life. When researchers examined TRAPPIST-1b before, their observations weren't sensitive enough to determine whether this world had an atmosphere or if it was just a barren rock. But now, we know. The planet is tidally locked to its star, which means that one of its sides always faces the star, while the other is stuck in perpetual darkness. 
The latest simulations suggest that if this planet had an atmosphere, its temperatures would be much lower since the air would redistribute the heat around both sides of the planet. Unfortunately, the James Webb Telescope recorded much hotter temperatures than needed for such a favorable scenario. It indicates the absence of an atmosphere and knocks the planet off our list of possibly habitable worlds. But the main excitement here isn't actually the features of TRAPPIST-1b. The main takeaway is that James Webb is capable of making such kinds of measurements. It'll help us explore the atmospheres and temperatures of many other distant worlds. During the recent years, scientists made two breakthrough discoveries about our universe. Thanks to new technologies, we've looked into the distant past. And we've learned something that can change our understanding of the universe forever. What are these discoveries and what do they mean to us? Let's find out. Recently, we unveiled the first color image from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a mind-bending photo capturing thousands of ancient galaxies. This oldest documented light in the history of the universe dates back over 13 billion years. That's just 600 million years after the Big Bang. It's like getting a sneak peek into the universe's baby album. But that was just the beginning. Astronomers were expecting to see some tiny young galaxies. But what they found was a real surprise. Impossibly early, impossibly massive, and all that from just a tiny red dot. The lead author of the study, Ivo Lab, was working at the computer as usual. And suddenly he got two numbers. Age, 13 billion years. Weight, 100 billion stars. When he realized what that meant, he nearly spit out his coffee. But that red dot was just the beginning. The next day they found five more galaxies just like this. Turns out, these six massive galaxies are as old as the Milky Way itself. The entire research team was in disbelief. They were like, wait, what? These guys couldn't be that mature so early in time. Did we make a mistake? But nope. The James Webb Space Telescope, the new cool guy on the space block, just has some serious skills. It can see through dust clouds with its infrared vision and spot galaxies that were previously invisible. Move over Hubble. There's a new stargazer in town. But why is it shaking things up so much? Because this discovery affects our understanding of how galaxies formed. Let's try to explain. A long time ago, 13.8 billion years ago to be precise, our universe was born. It was chilling out for a while and then it started to form the first galaxies. And these galaxies were full of gas and dust. Eventually this gas started turning into stars. Some galaxies were more massive and had more stars. And some were lighter and had almost no stars at all. In any case, they all grew gradually. The stars in them were born slowly and smoothly. That's how our current models explain this. But these new observations from the James Webb Space Telescope show an unexpected surprise. Looks like, even in the early universe, our ancient friends had lots of stars. More than what we would ever expect. If that's the case, then these galaxies are like the overachievers of the universe. They skipped the small and gradual growth phase and went straight to being giant universe breakers. According to our current cosmological model, they shouldn't even exist. But they do, so... It looks like after the Big Bang, the stars were forming much faster than we thought. Which is pretty weird. This could mean that there's something missing in our understanding of the galaxy formation. As you can see, these universe breakers are really living up to their name, causing a potential total consensus among scientists. The universe was like, Hey, I'm about to flip cosmology models upside down. But let's not jump to conclusions. There are many theories that could explain these mind-boggling discoveries without breaking the standard model. For example, maybe the light we're seeing isn't coming from stars at all, but from the swirling disks of doom around supermassive black holes. These colossal cosmic beasts can gobble up matter and spit out a dazzling light show. And James Webb Telescope's keen eye is picking up on these enigmatic accretion disks like never before. Or maybe these galaxies could be playing hide-and-seek with us. Maybe there's more to the story that we haven't seen yet. After all, the universe is vast and mysterious, and we've only just begun to scratch the surface. And whoa, 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 we really need to slow down here. Before we even try to explain all this stuff, we need to confirm whether these ancient galaxies really are that old. 
Although even if they're actually just supermassive black holes, it still shows an astounding change. We'll have to wait about a year to find out. One thing's for sure, the James Webb Space Telescope has definitely taught us a valuable lesson. Expect the unexpected. And this is just the beginning of unexpected. Evo Laba's team wasn't the only one who made such a huge breakthrough. There's also a team that claims that they've unlocked the secrets of the universe's past, and that's worth two Nobel Prizes. Move over, James Webb Space Telescope, because this discovery came from an antenna that's smaller than a fridge and costs less than $5 million. Talk about space bargain hunting! The astronomers caught this signal that showed some surprises. It was coming from the earliest stars of our universe, back in the days when they were just beginning to twinkle. Say hi to our celestial ancestors again. Now, the signal was pretty weird. The temperatures were unusually low, and there was a pronounced wave that left astronomers scratching their heads. What could be causing all this? Well, there's a theory. Dark matter may have been at work, and if that's the case, then we can really be on the verge of a great discovery. Imagine you're looking at the night sky filled with stars, but there's something else there that you can't see. It's like an invisible cloak that covers the entire universe. Scientists call this mysterious stuff dark matter. Dark matter is like the ghost of our world. It doesn't emit, absorb, or reflect any light. We can't see it with telescopes or our eyes. That's why we call it dark matter. But if we can't detect it in any way, how do we know it exists? Because of its gravitational pull. One day we noticed that our understanding of how galaxies were created was incorrect. According to our calculations, they should have been some chaotic gas. But something held them together, turning them into spirals like some kind of invisible glue. Then we thought, maybe this invisible glue really exists. If the moon was invisible, we would still suspect that it exists somewhere because its gravity affects the tides on Earth. This is also the case with dark matter. Its gravity influences the motion of galaxies and other cosmic objects. In fact, dark matter makes up a huge chunk of the universe, about 27% of it. Moreover, the normal matter we can see like stars, planets, and galaxies only make up about 5% of the universe. So even though we can't see dark matter, there's actually more of it in the universe than everything we can see. Scientists are still trying to figure out if dark matter exists and what it can be made of. Some theories suggest that it could be made up of exotic particles that are different from the particles that we're used to. Others think that it might be some kind of weird, undiscovered form of matter that doesn't interact with light at all. Anyway, it's an intriguing mystery, and if we ever confirm the existence of dark matter, our understanding of our world will change forever. So now you can understand why the excitement in the scientific community is palpable. If this discovery is confirmed, then we will get the first real proof of dark matter. This discovery may be even more important than the Big Bang itself because, as astronomers put it, we are made of star stuff, and so we are glimpsing at our origin. But of course, we still have to wait and explore all this in great detail. In science, one should never rush to conclusions. And while scientists study this stuff, we'll be here, on the edge of our seats waiting for the next space blockbuster to unfold. The universe never ceases to amaze us with its wonders. Who knew that such a small and humble antenna could unlock such cosmic secrets? It just goes to show that in the vastness of space, even the tiniest discoveries can have the biggest impact. Keep looking up, and who knows what other cosmic surprises are waiting to be uncovered. Oh, fasten your seatbelts. We're setting course for the most bizarre places in our universe, and you'll see the most mysterious phenomena few people have ever seen before. Recently, astronomers have discovered that the supermassive black hole at the center of our home Milky Way galaxy might be leaking. Why is it a significant change? Because it might mean that this black hole, called Sagittarius A-star, whose mass is 4.1 million times the mass of our Sun, isn't a sleeping giant as previously thought. It might still be active. And the leakage, recorded by scientists, may be the hole hiccuping while swallowing clouds of gas. Hey, I've been known to do that from time to time. During the research, the team of astronomers used the Hubble Space Telescope. It helped them spot a jet that looked like a blowtorch. It was pushing into clouds of hydrogen at the center of our galaxy. 
The jet seemed to spew gas like a hose directed into a pile of sand. This often occurs around other active black holes surrounded by the material drawn to them by their immense gravitational pull. Some of this material gets pulled into the black hole, but a small part of it gets swept outward by powerful magnetic fields. The research suggests that when a giant gas cloud gets too close to our supermassive black hole, it gets swallowed, and then the hole belches small jets of matter. Fermi bubbles might be the result of the belches that occurred around 2 to 4 million years ago. But recently, scientists have found another giant glowing bubble of hot gas. It aligned with the jet stretching for 35 light years or more from the supermassive black hole. Astronomers suspect that the jet could have plowed into this bubble of gas and inflated it. Now, let's visit some other breathtaking places in our universe. But be careful, some of them are extremely dangerous. Like this rotating neutron star called the Black Widow Pulsar. Just like its spider namesake, it's munching on its partner, a lightweight brown dwarf star. The more material this pulsar consumes, the more slowly it spins. The energy the neutron star is losing in the process causes the companion star to dwindle. If it does exist, nuclear pasta is the strongest material in the entire universe. Formed from the leftovers of extinguished stars, this substance gets squeezed into spaghetti-like tangles of material. It can break, but only if you apply 10 billion times the pressure needed to shatter steel. How about visiting a planet where it rains glass? Nah, I'd rather not. You see, this bright blue exoplanet looks peaceful and slightly familiar. Don't you think it slightly resembles Earth? But this pretty appearance hides the planet's terrifying nature. The winds blow at 5,400 miles per hour on its surface. That's seven times the speed of sound. But that's not the worst. It rains glass sideways in this scorching hot alien world. Solar tsunamis are a solar phenomenon dubbed terminator events. These tsunamis take place at the sun's equator. Disastrous magnetic field collisions seem to cause ginormous twin tsunamis of plasma. These tsunamis tear across the star's surface, moving at a speed of 1,000 feet per second. They can last for weeks at a time and happen every decade or so. Now look at this space body. Its nickname is Electric Hyperion. This Saturn's moon is one of the most bizarre-looking moons in the solar system, but its appearance isn't the strangest thing about it. This pumice stone-like rock, pockmarked with countless craters, is also charged with static electricity, and it's flowing out into space. Look at this, a rogue planet with auroras. Lost in space and drifting through galaxies, rogue planets were once flung away from their parent stars. But one of them, 200 light years away from Earth, is different from the rest. It's a planet-sized object with a magnetic field 200 times stronger than that of Jupiter. This field is so powerful that it generates flashing auroras in the planet's atmosphere. Be sure to stay away from black holes. Do I really need to warn you? Yep, they're some of the most perilous objects in the universe. But how about mini black holes? Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Even so, just one minuscule thing would have the mass of a thousand sedans. One theory claims that tons of micro black holes could have been created right after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. Some scientists even go as far as to say that a couple of mini black holes pass through our planet every day. Ooh, I'll bet you like our next stop, a burning ice planet. Far away Neptune-sized exoplanet Gliese 436b is a paradox. It's made of scorching hot ice. The planet completes one full orbit around the red dwarf Gliese 436 in just two days. It means it's traveling remarkably close to its parent star. That might be the reason the planet's temperatures rarely drop below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But the strangest thing? The planet hosts huge volumes of water ice known as Ice X, which remains solid despite blistering temperatures. Now, if you love jewelry, this next world is for you. A diamond planet. About 4,000 light years away from Earth, there's a planet that seems to be one enormous diamond. The planet is denser than any other discovered so far and consists mostly of carbon. It's so dense that astronomers think this carbon might be crystalline. This in turn might mean that at least some part of the planet is diamond. Moons orbiting other moons might exist, or they might not. Astronomers haven't agreed on this one yet. 
planets orbit stars, and moons orbit planets. But then, why can't there be moon moons, also known as submoons, moonettes, and moons? It actually sounds like one of those flowery Hawaiian dresses, you know, moo moos. But alas, no. Researchers claim that moon moons could exist, but the host moon has to be massive enough, the moon moon small enough, and there must be a wide gulf between these moons and the host planet. Now, I'll take you to the living fossil galaxy. DG Sat 1 is as big as the Milky Way, but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thinly. But what makes the galaxy unique is that it's sitting all alone, unlike other galaxies of this kind. Those are usually found in clusters. It can mean that DG Sat 1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, this galaxy is a real living fossil. Now, you won't be able to see the next space phenomenon, all because people can't see infrared light. And the phenomenon I'm talking about is an infrared stream from space. Neutron stars are ultra-dense collapsed cores of giant stars. They usually emit X-rays or radio waves. But in 2018, astronomers discovered a weird stream of infrared light. It seemed to be coming from a neutron star 800 light-years away from our planet. This signal was probably generated by a disk of dust surrounding the star. But this theory hasn't been proven yet. Behind the orbit of Neptune lies the mysterious Kuiper Belt, filled with massive icy objects. The most curious thing about this space formation, though, is that scientists fail to explain the pattern of its movement. The only explanation they have is that Neptune might be hiding from our sight a ginormous planet. This hypothetical planet has already got the name Planet 9. And all we have to do is wait until its existence is confirmed. Or not. Let's visit our star. But we need to be careful not to come too close. Because the Sun's atmosphere is hotter than the surface of the star. While on the surface, the temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. Scientists suspect that explosive bursts of heat from the Sun may have something to do with this unique phenomenon. Now this space object is also worth visiting. Haumea, a dwarf planet orbiting in the Kuiper Belt, has a bizarre elongated shape and two moons. The day on this planet lasts four hours, making it the fastest spinning big object in our solar system. But the most mysterious thing about Haumea is that the planet has a thin 40-mile-wide ring circling it. Ring-a-ding-ding. Space is a dangerous place. It seems like wherever you go, something tries to get rid of you. So what if you wanted to go up there without a spacesuit? What's good is that your body probably wouldn't explode. Your skin is strong and stretchy enough to deal with all that pressure. You wouldn't freeze right away either. In space, the only way for your body to lose heat is through radiation, which happens very slowly for a relatively cool object like a human body. You would eventually get cold, but it would take a while, or your fluids would evaporate. Keep your eyes closed if possible. Okay, the air would be the first emergency problem here. Your brain wouldn't be able to get oxygen, so you'd pass out within 15 seconds. And within three minutes, your brain would shut down forever. If someone rescued you within the first 30 seconds, you might only have some bruises on your skin from all the pressure changes. Hopefully you didn't try to hold your breath before they catapulted you out there, though. In that case, the air in your lungs would cause them to rupture, which again wouldn't be a happy end. But here's a spot where no one would be able to save you, the center of the galaxy. Each galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, and these are even worse than you might expect. They eat up a bunch of matter and release an enormous amount of energy. The largest of these gobblers, and the hungriest among them, are something we call quasars. Well, to be precise with the relations here, quasars actually contain supermassive black holes that eat everything in their way. And these quasars are some of the most energetic space objects that we know about. When something falls into a quasar, it gets really hot and shoots outward at very high speeds because of the strong radiation force. Quasars can deceive you if you try to observe them through a telescope because you might think you're looking at stars. Astronomers also named them quasi-stellar radio sources because the signals were coming from one place similar to how it goes with a star. But quasars, of course, have a stronger light 
they can shine much brighter than a galaxy with billions of stars. But this same radiation that makes them so bright is not such good news for the galaxies where they're located, because these guests are not very polite and they're slowly ripping them apart. Okay, maybe not that slowly. As a black hole eats matter, hot gases circles around it and produces very intense radiation, which then creates a quasar. Scientists use the famous Hubble Space Telescope to study 13 insanely powerful quasar outflows of radiation. This energy can travel at speeds over 40 million miles per hour and reach temperatures of billions of degrees. One particular outflow of radiation they studied got faster and went from nearly 43 million miles per hour to about 46 million miles per hour in only three years. The energy these outflows carry is several hundreds of times stronger than all the light our entire Milky Way galaxy emits. And all this hot gas is moving so fast that it can really cause a lot of damage to the host galaxy. It rushes through the galaxy like a massive tsunami, faster than anything we've previously discovered in space. At the same time, it's pushing apart all the potential material that could get together and form new stars. In just one year, this quasar wave can push away as much matter as hundreds of suns and create spectacular fireworks. I mean, the light show would be cool, but that seems like an awful lot of wasted material. These things we're discovering can really help us answer the question that's been bothering us for such a long time. Why do big galaxies stop growing after they reach a certain mass? No wonder when the quasars don't even allow new stars to be born. How rude! I mean, a black hole itself can't destroy the whole galaxy. When a star gets too close, a black hole will tear it apart with its strong gravity. This creates a lot of energy and a bright flare too. And even though we can't really see a black hole itself, scientists can at least study these flares. They can measure their energy more accurately than ever before because they look at how the surrounding dust absorbs and re-emits the light from the flares. It's actually similar to how echoes work. Scientists have also used NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory to study more than 100 galaxies and realized these black holes are consuming thousands of stars so they could gain more weight. There are different types of black holes. We call smaller ones stellar mass black holes. They're about 5 to 30 times the mass of our sun. On the other end of the scale, there are supermassive black holes that nest in the centers of large galaxies and weigh millions or even billions of times the mass of the Sun. And recent research tells us there are intermediate mass black holes which lie in between the two extremes. And it seems these intermediate black holes could be small black holes that had been eating lots of stars, becoming bigger. The special buffet a black hole just can't resist is when there's a dense cluster of stars in the center of a galaxy. Yup. So yeah, black holes are mean fellas, but there's still no way they could eat a whole galaxy. A black hole's gravity is just not strong enough, unless there's a quasar around, making its force stronger. Don't worry though, quasars are usually billions of light years away from us. That means we see them as they were billions of years ago, because light takes time to travel. And light years represent the amount of time necessary for that. It's great that we can study quasars, not because they're pretty cool, terrifying, but still cool. But because with their help, we can learn more about how our own galaxy formed and developed. Quasars are part of a larger group of objects called active galactic nuclei. This family tree also includes safer galaxies and blazars. These are not as awesome as their cousins, but okay, we'll give them a short introduction. Seyfert galaxies may look normal in regular images, but they emit a lot of infrared radiation, radio energy, and X-rays. Basically, they're similar to quasars but release less energy, and they have supermassive black holes at their centers too. Copycat! Blazar and quasar sound pretty similar, huh? Still, they're a bit different. The story of a blazar starts in a familiar way. At the center of a galaxy, there's a giant black hole surrounded by a disk of dust, gas, and debris that spins really fast. As the material in the disk falls towards the black hole, its gravitational energy can end up being converted to light. 
This makes the center of these galaxies very bright, and we call them active galactic nuclei. Some of these active galactic nuclei are not fine with just shining bright, so they shoot out jets of material that nearly reach the speed of light. This is a quasar. But when a galaxy happens to turn so that the jets point towards our home planet, it's what we call a blazar. And yes, it's like Earth is staring down the barrel of a cannon. Quasars and blazars emit jets of particles pointing towards us or in our direction. Scientists believe Seyfert galaxies are different because they emit jets pointing away from us, which is why it's harder to detect them. These jets from blazars can release particles with lots of energy that we call neutrinos. A couple of years ago, scientists discovered a single neutrino that traveled from a supermassive black hole in a blazar located about 4 billion light years away. This was so exciting because we've captured neutrinos from only three cosmic sources so far. Our sun, a supernova, which was a powerful explosion that happened in a nearby galaxy in 1987, and now from the blazar. You're in your galactic space cruiser on your way to Outpost 52, delivering supplies for the small colony there. When alarms begin going off, you scan your displays, but something catches your eye before you can work out what's happening. You don't need a view screen, as the front section of your ship is transparent, like a one-way mirror. A colossal orange and purple cloud is sweeping towards you. There's no time to analyze it. You put the ship into a dive, as steep as it will go. The alarms go crazy, but you're too focused on getting out of danger. The ship rattles, and you think it will break up. But your ship is fast and powerful, and somehow you manage to get underneath it. You look up and see the gigantic plasma cloud go soaring past. Curiosity has bitten you, and you decide to follow it. You program your computer to analyze it. Soon the information is coming back, and you can't believe what it's telling you. This plasma cloud is a wrecker of galaxies. It and others like it have been ending galaxies before their time. You recall your studies back on Earth when you were just a young pilot. There have been studies as far back as the 21st century as to why galaxies were mysteriously ceasing the formation of new stars, causing them to end ultimately. Stars form from thick clouds of gas that have become extremely cold. They condense and, over time, collapse into solid compact matter. There's a famous photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Most people have seen it. It's called the Pillars of Creation. It's the Eagle Nebula, where stars are forming. They call these environments star nurseries. It's a pretty cute concept if you think about it. But there's a bad guy lurking, and you're following it. It's a vast star wrecker. The wrecker rushes in and sweeps the gas out of these star-forming galaxies at an accelerated rate, preventing stars from forming in the first place. It's like a giant broom. But rather than cleaning up, it's ceasing up, bringing new galaxies to a premature end. Now that you know how dangerous it is, it's best to hang back a bit. Let's see if we can see it in action from a safe distance. It had been a long-standing mystery why some galaxies don't birth new stars. The star wrecker is smart. It hangs around large galaxy clusters. There's one in particular, the Virgo cluster. This is the one that scientists studied and came across the star wrecker. The nearby Virgo cluster is 7 million light years across and contains thousands of galaxies. When I say nearby, it's about 65 million light years from us. Not exactly a weekend space cruise away, but it's pretty close in galactic terms. The cluster hurtles through the superheated plasma at speeds of up to a million miles per hour. The cluster forms the basis for the large Virgo supercluster, of which the local group, where our Milky Way resides, is a member. Its proximity to us makes it easier for scientists to study. It's also one of the most extreme regions of the universe that we know of, currently. Who knows what else is out there? The Virgo cluster is also unusual, as it's still forming new stars. And we can observe them, such as in the famous Hubble nursery photo. A galaxy in this cluster is called the Messier 87. It was discovered way back in 1781 by a French astronomer named Charles Messier. It looked a bit fuzzy to him, so he called it a nebula, a nebula without stars. More information on what it was couldn't be ascertained until the 1920s. Messier was well-respected and, in his lifetime, discovered 13 comets. 
He was born in rural France, the 10th of 12 children. When he was 14, he witnessed a tremendous six-tailed comet in 1744. It was astonishing and was visible to the naked eye for several months. Its effects were dramatic and unusual. It was so bright that it's been recorded as the sixth brightest in history. Four years later, young Charles saw a solar eclipse from his hometown on the 25th of July, 1748. He knew then that he wanted to explore the world of astronomy. It was meant to be. A lunar crater and an asteroid have been named after him. Nothing is mighty, however, like the Messier 87, or M87. It's a supergiant elliptical galaxy with trillions of stars. It's the second brightest galaxy within the northern Virgo cluster, making it popular amongst astronomers and amateur enthusiasts. Elliptical galaxies are older, low-mass stars with minimal star formation activity. Large numbers of globular clusters surround them. They make up roughly 10 to 15% of the Virgo supercluster. M87 has a supermassive black hole at its core. The black hole was photographed using data collected in 2017 by the Event Horizon Telescope, EHT. It was announced excitedly to the world in 2019. In March 2021, the EHT collaboration revealed a polarized-based image of the black hole for the first time. It was a pretty exciting event. It was the first time that a black hole had been captured. It happened all thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope, which is many radio observatories or radio telescope facilities around the world, all working together to produce a highly sensitive and high-resolution telescope. Another array of telescopes in Chile is called the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA. They captured high-resolution images of the 51 significant galaxies in the Virgo cluster. That's part of how we know what we know. M87 and other galaxies don't appear to be doing a lot to the naked eye. In fact, in a typical human lifetime, they barely move at all. Yet, they are made up of gas, dust, and other objects that move through space at high speeds. They move when affected by the gravity of other galaxies, or dark matter, a mysterious entity that is five times more common than ordinary matter. Many galaxies, including our own, are believed to have a halo of dark matter surrounding them. The dark matter can pull more significantly on the smaller galaxies outside the clusters. As the galaxy gets dragged around through space, the star wrecker may come across. Giant clouds of intergalactic plasma, a form of electric gas, can behave like an atmosphere and drain the gas inside the galaxy. It sweeps out the gas inside the galaxy, stripping it of what it needs to make stars. It's hard to grasp the scale of this sort of activity, but that's what scientists now believe has been occurring to some galaxies or the nebulae without stars, as Charles Messier saw it. Now, let's park our space cruiser here and watch this thing in action. What we've been calling star wrecking is known as gas stripping. It's one of the most spectacular and violent external events in space. A scientist from the National Research Council of Canada said that galaxies are moving so fast through hot plasma in the cluster that a vast quantity of cold molecular gas is stripped from the galaxy. It's as though the gas is being swept away by a giant cosmic industrial blower. It's not the sort of clean-out we want to happen in our galaxy. You observe it in action. You're impressed, but equally respectful of its great power. The gas stripping, also known as ram pressure stripping, travels through many galaxies and removes a star-forming gas. The process is very efficient. The gas is behaving differently from the clouds in our galaxy. They aren't forming as many stars as they are in ours. A 21st century study found that the same process happens in smaller groups of only a few galaxies, with much less dark matter. The study looked at a staggering 10,567 satellite galaxies. These are galaxies that exist beyond the enormous galaxy clusters. Most galaxies in the universe exist in between 2 and 100 galaxies. They were able to study such a large number by using stacking. It makes it possible to learn about a collection of faint objects by combining all the information from the objects and making an average characteristic. They ultimately determined that gas stripping, or star wrecking, is potentially the main way that galaxies, predominantly star formation, are shut down by their surroundings. Pretty unfortunate to have such a nasty neighbor. So, now that your curiosity has been satisfied, 
it's best to leave this plasma cloud and get on with your journey to Outpost 52. You're going to be late now and could be in a whole lot of trouble. While the cruiser turns around, we'll head back to Earth. And back in time, back to 1744, to that night in rural France where a teenager stood outside, marveling at the night sky and the spectacular vista of the six-tailed comet. And from that moment, was inspired to begin a lifelong quest based on a single question, perhaps the ultimate of all, what's out there? Do me a favor, will you? Try to imagine the first time you went camping. Maybe you went with your parents. Maybe it happened on a class field trip with your schoolmates. Regardless, try to picture, or remember, what it felt like as the day was coming to an end. The sun has set, but there's still some light outside. Let's say you were lying down, trying to rest for a bit. What's the first thing you remember seeing when looking up? If you're anything like me, it was probably the overwhelming number of stars twinkling right before you. These stars, most of which you can see without any fancy devices, are part of the Milky Way. Believe it or not, our amazing galaxy is almost as old as the universe itself. Age aside, it's also a pretty nice place to be. The Milky Way is like a cosmic nursery where new stars are born. And let me tell you, it's home to some of the most fascinating places, at least from what we can see in pictures. Take the Mystic Mountain, an area in the Carina Nebula. Here, things are always splashing and full of energy. That's because of gas columns collapsing and creating crazy opposing jets that are thrown around like acrobats in a circus. It's like a signature move for stars being born, you know? And if you take a look at this awesome picture, you'll see the elements putting on a colorful show. Blue represents oxygen, green is for hydrogen and nitrogen, and red is the sizzling sulfur. Ready for our next stop on our ride through the Milky Way? Check out these huge twisted clouds of interstellar dust and gas hanging out in the center of M16, also known as the Eagle Nebula. We've got ourselves the super cool pillars of creation, which are like towering columns where brand new stars like to hide and chill. Now, I know this ain't the first time the Hubble telescopes captured this epic sight, but trust me, this is the most mind-blowingly detailed image yet. The pillars are getting showered with crazy hot ultraviolet light from a bunch mm. of young stars hanging just outside the frame. These stellar superstars are actually causing the towers of dust and gas to gradually get worn away by their gusty winds. Brace yourself for the numbers, too. These pillars of creation stretch out for about four to five light years. Yeah, it sounds big, but in the grand scheme of things, they're kind of like the cute little siblings of the larger Eagle Nebula, which spans a whopping 70 by 55 light years. The nebula was first spotted back in 1745 by an awesome Swiss astronomer, and it's about 7,000 light years away from our humble abode in the constellation Serpents. Here's the quirky part, though. As productive as it might sound, the Milky Way's star-forming activity is quite rare when compared to other galaxies. Astronomers have noticed that the pace at which stars are being born is actually dropping, and they're itching to figure out why. But before we can dive into this weird phenomenon, let's look at how stars come into existence in the first place. It's hard for us to know for sure from down here. What we can gather about a star's life cycle comes from looking at those within our local Milky Way. Stars are formed in colder clouds of gas and dust called nebulae. These areas are pretty common throughout most galaxies. These nebulae have low temperatures that are crucial for hydrogen gas to stick together. As the clump gathers more gas, it causes movement, which itself creates energy. When more gas collides with the already formed clump, all that energy transforms into heat. This keeps going until the temperature grows considerably, sparking the birth of a star. The most secure time of a star's life is also known as its main sequence. 
I'll spare you the chemistry lesson, but during this time, the star produces both heat and radiation. It's because of the radiation that there's pressure around a star, and it's also the reason for most of the light found in a certain galaxy. Now let's talk star sizes. The bigger the star, the faster it consumes its fuel. These massive stars shine the brightest, emitting high energy UV light. On the other hand, lower mass brighties live longer, despite not being as shiny as their larger siblings. There's a variety of star sizes in most galaxies we're able to see from down here. Some stars are 0.1% the size of the sun, while others have 10 times its mass. Once a star finishes up its fuel, it welcomes its grand finale and transforms into a faded star. Stars about the same size as the sun or smaller can no longer produce radiation at this stage. Gravity takes over, causing their matter to settle into a white dwarf. For bigger stars, the timeline changes a bit. They too collapse, but there's a lot more stuff burning, and it's also hotter in there. This collapse creates a stronger core. When all of the star's insides are done for, the outer layers collapse in a jiffy. It bounces off the core at nearly the speed of light. It's an impressive, explosive event called a supernova. The blown out material becomes the basis for future stars. It also leaves behind a black hole. Now that we know a bit about a star's life, let's try to look at each generation, if you'd like. Stars don't just pop up constantly at the same rate. Currently, the universe is manufacturing only about one-ninth the number of stars compared to its star-forming glory days, which happened roughly 10 billion years ago. One study gave us a peek on the history of star forming. In writing it, two scientists teamed up to gather a ton of data about galaxies. They sorted these galaxies based on how far away they were. By doing this, they could track how the brightness of galaxies has changed over the universe's lifetime. Since stars give off most of a galaxy's light, they could use that brightness to figure out how many stars were forming using some fancy math. Their findings confirmed that star formation was pretty wimpy when the universe was young. But as gas started to gather in galaxies, boom! Star formation skyrocketed until about 10 to 11 billion years ago when it hit its peak. After that, star formation took a nosedive. In today's observable universe, it's dropped a lot. That means around 50% of the stars we see today were born in the first 5 billion years post Big Bang. A mere quarter formed in the last 6 billion years. So what's causing this cosmic shift? Well, scientists think it's all about that cold gas that stars need when they're born. When galaxies form, the gas gets concentrated inside, leading to a star formation extravaganza. But then, the gas is used up quickly as stars doze off. When supernovae come into play, they blast away that much needed gas for future star making. Not to mention it also changes the chemistry of that gas. This crucial piece of information could be a starting point for the star-making decline we see today. Scientists are still not sure why this gas becomes useless. Galaxies are also pretty complex to begin with. There are all sorts of forces involved in maintaining their balance. For instance, when a supernova goes boom, the shock waves can sometimes cause turbulence and clumping of the gas, sparking the birth of new stars. But if the supernova is too wild, it can blast that same gas right out of the galaxy. With no gas left in the area, there's little to no chance a new star could form. Now, what does the future hold? Some scientists can't help but wonder what might happen if no new stars pop up. The universe might be simply filled with black holes and fading stars. Solar systems would become inhospitable as their stars lose power and those ravenous black holes might munch on whatever material is left. As gloomy as it seems, you do have to admit it's a mind-boggling concept. Luckily, we don't have to worry about it happening anytime soon. 
the universe is a whopping 13.7 billion years old. But the dark era isn't expected to kick in until somewhere way further in the future. But hey, this is just one possible outcome of the decline in star formation. Who knows what other wacky possibilities the universe holds. In the heart of the galaxy, there lies a mysterious object, the likes of which no astronomer has ever seen. It streaks across the sky like a shooting star on caffeine. So what is this mysterious blob? And how is it related to the black hole in the center of our galaxy? Let's find out. This thing is called X7. It's the mysterious blob that's been hanging around our galaxy's supermassive black hole for decades. Some even say it's been lurking around there for, like, hundreds of years. We know a few things about X7. For example, it weighs around 50 times as much as Earth. It may sound like a lot if you're an Earthling, but in space, that's like a tiny drop in the ocean. X7 is also moving pretty fast, at speeds of up to 700 miles per second. That's faster than you trying to catch the last slice of pizza before your roommate gets to it. But what in the world is this thing? A magic star we've never seen before? An extraterrestrial spaceship? Well, there are some theories connected to the blob's future tragic fate. Unfortunately, X7's days are numbered. Right now, it's on a 170-year-long elliptical orbit around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. But it's not going to make it that far. Each year, it's spiraling closer and closer to the black hole. In just a few years, it will become spaghettified. Yes, that's a real scientific term. And finally get sucked in, never to be seen again. There are supermassive black holes in the centers of all galaxies, including our very own Milky Way. These black holes are so massive that they warp space-time, causing nearby stars to orbit around them at incredible speeds. They serve as cosmic vacuum cleaners that suck in anything and everything that comes close enough. The black hole in our galaxy is called the Sagittarius A star. Sounds like the name of a fancy Hollywood celebrity, doesn't it? But this celestial object is far more impressive than any mere mortal. It's about 4 million times more massive than our sun, which means it could probably eat our entire solar system for breakfast. But don't worry, these black holes may seem really scary, but in reality, they're too small to compete with an entire galaxy. They'll just suck in a couple of the nearest stars, and that's all. Also, Sagittarius A star doesn't seem to have a very good appetite. It's been observed to be pretty quiet lately, which is good news for us. But even if it were super greedy, it wouldn't pose any threat to us. This black hole is over 26,000 light years away. From Earth, we can see it in the Sagittarius constellation. In 2022, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration released the first ever image of Sagittarius A star. It took years of collaboration and technology to capture this stunning image. And this is our second photo of a black hole in history. The first one was released in 2019, and it showed the supermassive black hole called M87 star. Yes, they both have star in their names. Don't try to make it make sense. Anyway, you may remember this photo as the first ever image of a black hole ever. It went crazy viral across the internet. And this black hole, M87 star, located in the Messier 87 galaxy, is way scarier than Sagittarius A star. You thought 4 million solar masses is impressive? Then how about 2.5 billion solar masses? M87 is a real monster. It's also known for its powerful jets of plasma, which are so energetic that they extend thousands of light years from the black hole's center. If M87 were a superhero, it would be Iron Man with his repulsor beams on full blast. Now, technically, you can't take a photo of a black hole itself since it's, well, black. No light can escape its grasp. 
But the glowing orange ring in this photo shows the matter surrounding Sagittarius A star. It's called the accretion disk, a swirling disk of hot gas that spirals the center, heating up to millions of degrees in the process. It's like a giant fiery vortex, but with no escape. And the shadow in the center indicates the black hole itself. Inside that shadow, there's an event horizon. The event horizon is the boundary around the black hole beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape its gravitational pull. It's the point of no return, where the gravitational force is so strong that even the fastest object in the universe, light, can't escape. Once you cross the event horizon, you're doomed to fall toward the center of the black hole, where the laws of physics as we know them break down. And this is exactly the fate that awaits our unfortunate X7. Right now, the pure blob is getting stretched and yanked by powerful tidal forces. By the way, before it meets its untimely demise, X7 is expected to put on a bit of a show. Its closest approach to the black hole, called periastron, is projected to happen in 2036. And when it finally gets torn apart by the Sagittarius A star's gravitational forces, there may be some cool fireworks to see. But this is not the most important thing. The funny part is, X7's future end may help us finally understand what the heck even is this thing? A team of scientists have been studying how a strange blob orbits the black hole. And that's when they discovered that X7 has stretched to almost twice its initial length. And what does that mean? Well, it suggests that X7 is most likely made of debris ejected during a recent collision between two stars. Yep, you heard that right, a space car crash. Imagine this, two stars fall in love and start circling each other for many years. After that, they finally merge together. At this moment, they eject tons of gas and dust. And perhaps this cosmic dance created our blob baby, X7. It's basically like the crumbs left on the table after a giant space beast. Something like this is actually pretty common, especially around black holes. It's like a galactic fender bender that sends debris flying everywhere. Actually, the universe is full of mystery blobs. They're called the G-objects. No, they're not the G-men from Men in Black, but they're just as mysterious and elusive. These guys have been puzzling astronomers for more than 20 years. They look like gas clouds, but behave like stars. It's like they can't decide whether they want to be a cloud or a star. Come on, guys, make up your mind. G objects stretch out the closest point to the central black hole, but emerge intact, like a rubber band that stretches but doesn't break. Scientists think that they're the stars that have merged together into one. And while doing that, they also produce a huge cloud of gas that hides the result from view. Kind of like when you're wearing a bulky sweater so that no one knows that you've put on a few extra pounds. And then a study published in 2021 found that one of these objects, G2, was actually a molecular cloud concealing three baby stars. Huh, talk about a plot twist. But X7 is the black sheep of the strange blob family. It's significantly different from the G objects, like the weird cousin you see once a year at family gatherings. Its evolution has been more dramatic. Also, it's not being held together by a mass lurking in its center. So what is it being held together by? Pixie dust? Magic? We need answers! That's why scientists believe that X7 isn't a G object itself but debris left from it. Or maybe not. We have no idea. The possibilities are endless, and that's what makes astronomy so exciting. So let's keep our eyes on the skies and see what other strange objects are out there. Who knows, maybe we'll discover another mystery blob, and this time it's going to be a spaceship. Now that would be awesome. The Big Bang Theory doesn't explain how exactly our cosmos started. It's more like a story about what happened after in the earliest stages of the universe. That's when all stars, galaxies, and specks of dust were crammed into a dot 
no bigger than a peach with a temperature of more than a trillion degrees. Our cosmos doesn't have an edge or outside. The Big Bang wasn't an explosion that happened at some particular point. It was the moment when space itself began to expand everywhere at the same time. That's a process we call inflation. When the cosmos was nearly a million times smaller than today, everything was just a plasma that later expanded, cooled, and then converted into a neutral gas. That was the time when the first atoms formed. All these processes released enormous amounts of radiation. The cosmic microwave background, CMB, is the fossil of that radiation that dates back to about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Before that, the heat from the creation of the universe was way too intense for even light to shine. Only after matter cooled down did it get lighter because the universe became less dense and more transparent. In the first three minutes of this process, certain light elements formed, such as hydrogen and helium. About 400 million years after the Big Bang, the cosmos slowly started coming out of its dark ages. This period probably lasted over half a billion years. Clumps of gas came together and formed something beautiful, the very first stars and galaxies. All this gave off lots of ultraviolet light. It was as if someone finally turned on a cosmic flashlight that cleared away the foggy gas that was all around. About 9 billion years later, our solar system got into the game too. It was born from this dense cloud of interstellar dust and gas. The cloud fell apart, possibly because of the shockwave produced by a star that exploded somewhere nearby in a spectacular supernova. This left us with a solar nebula, a disk of material that kept spinning. At its center, gravitational forces kept pulling more and more material in. At one moment, the pressure at the core became so great that hydrogen atoms started to mix and form helium. Like it happens with other processes in space, this released giant amounts of energy. And ta-da, we got our star! So big that it makes up over 90% of all the matter in our solar system. The remaining matter from the disk had its own job to do. It probably started off as grains of dust even smaller than the width of your hair. Gravity and other forces made clumps smash into one another. They got bigger and bigger. Particles of dust eventually evolved into pebbles. And then, as this donut-shaped disk of gas kept spinning, they turned into rocks. Meanwhile, the star pulled in nearby gas and pushed the rest of the material farther away. Those parts of the disk were far away from the sun, so water in those regions started to freeze. Soon, there were tiny pieces of ice flying around, gathering into dirty snowballs that became planetary cores. Since it was cold, gas molecules could slow down enough for a planet to draw them closer. That's how we got our famous gas giants, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. Jupiter and Saturn probably formed first, maybe even within the first 10 million years of the existence of our solar system. Parts of the disk that were closer to the Sun remained warm. The material there gathered into rocky planets. After the icy giants appeared, not much gas was left for the other ones, though. So, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars ended up a bit smaller. They may have taken tens of millions of years to form after the Sun was born. This is, of course, a very simplified version of how we got eight planets in our solar system. Who knows if we'll ever know the whole truth? Time went on. Space debris was swirling around. Some objects became large enough for their gravitational force to shape them into spheres. That's how we got dwarf planets and big moons. Our asteroid belt is the region that separates inner planets from outer ones. It's full of pieces and bits from the early solar system that never grew into something bigger. They just kept on floating around, maybe waiting for another chance. Other smaller leftovers turned into comets, meteoroids, asteroids, and small irregular moons. 
4.5 billion years ago, something else arose from all that chaos. A planet almost as big as Mars collided with Earth. And the debris formed the only moon we have today. Somewhere around that time, the Sun also got to a new level. At its younger stages, it was just a ball of helium and hydrogen that still wasn't powered by fusion. Over millions of years, it got hotter and more pressurized, and finally turned into the shining star we know today. It's supposed to stay like this for a very, very long time. Around 10 billion years. Simulations scientists have made to understand the creation of the universe show that the chaos of that time was even bigger than we thought. Orbits of the giant planets probably shifted during that period, too. The gravitational force from many objects in the Kuiper Belt shook Saturn and Jupiter into a 2-1 resonance. That means Jupiter made a circle around the Sun twice for every Saturn orbit. This brought the two giants closer together, which wasn't good for their surroundings. There's a theory that Uranus didn't form where it is today, which is 20 times farther from our Sun than Earth. At this distance, there wasn't enough material to make the whole planet. That's why there's an idea that Uranus was born closer to the Sun before it got ejected farther away for some reason. Maybe that reason was the mess Jupiter and Saturn made. Some believe Neptune shares a similar destiny, together with the whole Kuiper Belt. As Uranus and Neptune were passing through the Kuiper Belt, they scattered most of the objects there. Any additional ice planets that had formed there also ended up kicked out, but in this case, entirely out of our solar system. Pieces of these scattered worlds that were located more outwardly stayed in the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, a faraway sphere of ice bodies where the majority of comets come from. In all this chaos, the inner planets got hit. Scientists think that's how we got organics and water here on Earth. That's exactly what we needed for life to start developing, somewhere 3.8 to 3.5 billion years ago. We found evidence of microbes in the hard structures they made. Those are called stromatolites. They help us understand the earliest forms of life on Earth. Up until 3 billion years ago, Mars might have also been a good place for life. The red planet used to have a thick atmosphere and a strong magnetic field, just like Earth. But unlike our planet, Mars cooled from the inside, which switched off this whole mechanism. Without its magnetic field, nothing could protect the planet from the solar wind that pulled away most of its atmosphere in just a few hundred million years. Mars used to have magnificent lakes, rivers, and water streams that left traces we can see on its surface, even today. Luckily, Earth managed to keep its water, so life continued to evolve. 2.5 billion years ago, Earth got photosynthetic organisms that started pumping oxygen into the atmosphere and helped create the entire animal and plant kingdom across the planet. Another big thing happened in our solar system later. Saturn got its astonishing rings. No one knows for sure what happened back then, but a new theory says the rings aren't as old as the planet itself, only about a hundred million years old. At the same time, something hit our moon and left Tycho Crater, one of the most prominent craters on the lunar surface. Other planets couldn't avoid collisions either, including Earth. You already know what happened 66 million years ago. A giant asteroid triggered changes in climate and erased three quarters of life including dinosaurs. Ooh, you're on a beautiful planet with unusual nature. Around you are ordinary people walking on this exotic planet. And now, get this, it's our new home. Humanity decided it was time to leave the Earth, and now we live very far away in another galaxy. But what happened to our home planet? Well, our solar system itself had an expiration date. It's been 7.5 billion years since 2020, and the Sun began to expand, absorbing planet after planet – Mercury, Venus, Earth. But the living conditions on Earth were unsuitable for us long before that. Let's go back there. 
In 4.5 billion years, our entire Milky Way galaxy will experience an incredible incident. The Andromeda galaxy will hit us at great speed. As a result of the collision, some stars will be thrown into distant space, while others will form new solar systems. But most likely, all life in the new Milko Media or Milkdromeda galaxy will cease to exist. That's why people decided to pack up their things, get into new generation spacecrafts, and go to distant space in search of a new home. There can be an infinite number of planets in the universe on which humans can theoretically live. One of the main ingredients, the planet must orbit the star in its habitable zone. This means the temperature must allow the water to be liquid. We find similar star systems almost every year and have recently found the nearest one. It's Proxima Centauri. There are at least two planets around this red dwarf on which we can build our new home. But the problem is that this system is as far as 4.2 light-years away. So we had to open our garage and choose a vehicle that could take us so far. Saturn V is a rocket that used to take humans to the moon. It could reach the speed 30 times faster than the speed of sound. Today, we have more advanced technologies, like the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. However, its speed is still about the same. It would take such a rocket about 113,000 years to overcome the distance to the closest star. So, you walk through the garage further and see the fastest human-made space object ever. The Parker Solar Probe. Its speed is a little less than half a million miles per hour, but it uses the gravity of the sun to accelerate. Let's assume we can build a rocket that can reach this speed. Now, we sit behind a star map, do calculations, draw diagrams, and 6,600 years. And now, let's look at the photon. These are the tiniest particles that travel at the speed of light. And an obvious thought comes to your mind. How do you build a ship that can travel as fast as a photon? Well, until recently, travel at this speed was considered impossible. Fundamental laws of physics say that no object that has a mass can accelerate this much. Energy is required to accelerate mass. And to reach the speed of light, which is about 186,000 miles per second, we need an infinite amount of energy. But it's still too slow. Raise your eyes and look at the sun. It's so close to us. But the light from it reaches our planet in 8 minutes. About the time it takes to go through the drive through and get your burger. And the journey to the nearest star will take 4.2 years. You can graduate from college during such a period. But we may have found a way to cheat the laws of physics and travel faster than light. Warp drive. It's a technology that manipulates space and time to break the laws of motion. In science fiction, it's a kind of feel that envelops a spacecraft like a bubble or a shell and allows it to significantly exceed the speed of light. And we already have a similar technology, sort of. It's the Alcubier warp drive. Since it's impossible to move at the speed of light in normal space-time, the ship must move by compressing the space in front of it and expanding it behind it. So not only the ship itself moves, but so does the space-time inside this bubble. In fact, this will allow the spacecraft to move at any speed, even 10 times faster than the speed of light. But to warp space-time, the ship must be simply humongous in size. It will need the quantity of energy comparable to the amount of mass energy of the whole planet of Jupiter. But at recent symposiums, scientists began to say that there is hope. In 2069, NASA plans to launch an interstellar mission to explore inhabitable planets outside our solar system. We do not yet know the details of this mission. It doesn't even have a name yet, but it will be dedicated to the 100th anniversary of the Apollo mission, the first man landing on the moon's surface. Here, near Pasadena, California, a small group of scientists from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab are trying their best to make it happen, and their latest calculations have made everyone shout Eureka! It turns out the ring around the ship, which should create the so-called warp field, shouldn't be perfectly round as it was thought before. It's more like donut-shaped. This will greatly simplify the design and construction. And the best part? To test this technology, a spacecraft the size of Voyager 1 probe will suffice. Researchers are now aiming to reach at least 10% of the speed of light and launch the probe to Alpha Centauri. In this case, 
to overcome the distance of 4.4 light years, the probe will need about 44 years. For comparison, the Voyager 1 mission was launched on September 5, 1977. In 43 years, it's traveled about 14 billion miles and is the most remote human-made object. It's also the loneliest one in the universe. It has long since left the boundaries of our solar system and is moving further into outer space. But rest assured, scientists have a couple more ideas in their secret laboratories. There are rumors now that they know how to reach the speed of light. The Space Association is considering launching small drones powered by lasers. Nuclear force, as well as collisions of matter and antimatter, can give enough energy to accelerate an object to the speed of light, too. But their colleagues in a nearby laboratory are working hard to implement another technology – ion propulsion. It uses gas particles accelerated by the electric field. Simply put, your regular rocket is a daredevil on the road. He pulls the throttle to the max and burns an incredible amount of fuel to accelerate to the speed he needs. But ion propulsion is a careful old lady driving. She slowly presses the gas pedal and accelerates. On the scale of space, the old lady will have more efficiency and will be able to drive much further than the daring young man. Something we'll keep an eye on. Still, an unknown number of years will pass until there's a way to implement warp drive or ion propulsion. We want to make humankind interstellar. But first, we need to keep it alive at least. Now we're actively developing technologies to send the first manned mission to Mars. Colonization of Mars will be the first stage to make our species interstellar. It'll be a kind of rehearsal before colonizing distant planets. We must understand that although the conditions on the exoplanets may be close to earthly ones, we will still have to terraform them. We must test our technology on Mars to warm it up to the normal Earth temperature. We also need to increase atmospheric pressure so that water could exist in a liquid state and create an ozone layer that will protect us from solar radiation. After that, we'll be able to breathe freely on the surface of Mars without spacesuits. We need to master all these technologies before we can create a real warp drive. Centuries ago, people sailed the oceans and perfected their ships to fully explore our planet. Now, we will be the generation to build new ships and go on long journeys outside the Earth. Warp drive will open up incredible horizons for us. Take a look at our galaxy. There are countless stars. Around each of them may be planets, and on some of them, there may be life. Warp drive will allow us to get in contact with this life and explore our galaxy much faster. And this future is already close. Soon, we'll have the chance to join the pioneers, put on beautiful suits, and travel the expanses of space in search of adventure.